Hi guys, welcome back to another true crime and makeup time video. So today's case caught my eye in just a local news article that I was reading and it's a really sad case and trigger warning from the outset, this case does deal with mental illness and a violent attack. When I listened to the emergency call, I was just shocked. I mean, imagine you're an emergency dispatcher and you get a phone call from a woman who's frantic yet coherent and She's trying to explain to you that it's a life or death situation and she needs help immediately. She tells you she got into an altercation with her mother and she had now chopped her head off with a knife. I mean, before we even get into it, I just want to be sure that I deal with this case with sensitivity and all the cases I talk about with sensitivity and just want to make sure we remember that the victim's families are still out there and they are the ones that are left to deal with the aftermath of situations like that. So this is just me retelling information that is already out there and we never really know what happens in people's lives and people's families. So just be kind in the comments down below and let's get into it. Jessica Camilleri was born on 12th October 1993 I believe to her Maltese Australian parents, Vince and Rita. Jessica was the youngest. She had an older sister and her older sister was described as normal. Whereas Jessica from an early age displayed signs that she was not. Growing up, Jessica showed signs of delayed milestones such as walking, talking, balance and coordination. It was clear that she was not going to be following in her sister's path and would be a few steps behind kids her age. Jessica was born with an intellectual disability, which put her IQ at 55 to 60. And then normal, I say normal, people's IQs are between 90 to 110. So this meant that Jessica was in the bottom 1% of the population. And I say normal because you know, how accurate really is this? What is a normal IQ, you know? And anyone who has had multiple kids can understand the stress when one of your kids doesn't match the milestones of their siblings. And, you know, each kid does develop at their own pace, but when one child is clearly showing signs that something is off, it can just put so much stress on a parent, on a marriage, on a family. However, despite this, Jessica was still able to communicate normally. She was articulate and eloquent when she spoke. In school, Jessica was placed in an intermediate class because her teachers were aware of her delays with reading, writing, maths, and other subjects. As one can imagine, when you are years behind your peers, when you need special attention and you don't attend the same classes as them, kids can be cruel, and they were. They teased, taunted, and harassed Jessica for being different. People react in different ways to bullying and Jessica reacted with rage. It is believed that due to her disabilities and the way she was treated by her peers, she developed IED. IED is intermittent explosive disorder and it's basically a mental health condition marked by frequent impulsive anger outbursts and aggression. The episodes that these people have are usually out of proportion to the situation that actually triggered them and it can cause them significant distress. People with IED have a low tolerance for frustration and challenges and outside of these outbursts, these anger outbursts, they have quite normal behavior. These episodes could manifest as verbal arguments, physical fights, temper tantrums and aggression. And it's not just an angry outburst. It's actually a mental disorder that usually starts showing signs at the age of six and only intensifies as you get older. So approximately 80% of people with IED also have other mental health conditions like anxiety disorders, externalizing disorder, intellectual disabilities, autism, and bipolar disorder. And those are like the most common. Later on, we'll talk more about Jessica's diagnosis, but I believe that when she was younger, I did read that she was diagnosed with autism. It stated that this led her to have deficits in judgment and awareness for other people's thoughts, feelings, and empathy towards others. This basically means that she didn't really understand other people's feelings, thoughts, emotions, and she didn't have empathy towards them. And if you really think about it, it definitely causes a lot of challenges for her even living a normal life, but then doing more complex activities like taking public transport 
by yourself, managing your finances, grocery shopping, getting a job, working at a job, it will be super difficult. Jessica's autism caused her to live in a world where she was fixated on certain things, which included a fascination of horror movies that she was able to watch and progress this obsession without monitoring. Her autism caused Jessica to live in her own world, a world where she was fascinated with horror movies. And this obsession and fixation was allowed to progress without any monitoring, allegedly. It is said that she would watch the same movies over and over again, like Texas Chainsaw and Jeepers Creepers. Those were the ones she would love to just watch repeatedly. Jessica stated that she would spend hours every day for weeks, months, years, decades, watching the same movies, looking at the same videos over and over and over again. At school, Jessica would have explosive outbursts, ones where she would attack students and even teachers, and this caused her to get suspended a few times. Her rage was almost always directed towards females, other females mostly, but one time she did bite a male student, and even when people had tried to pull her off him, she refused to disengage her teeth. When she was a teenager, Jessica's parents separated, and her father, Vince, was desperate to find some sort of solution for his daughter, a way to discipline her and manage her troubling behavior. But his attempts were often met by frustration and confusion. But I'm not sure how accurate, you know, this truly is. And I read that he was really struggling with how to provide the best care for his daughter. And he tried to find her the best care and meet her his daughter's needs and help her with her daily life struggles. However, it's also said that Vince grew frustrated with Rita and this was because no matter how bad Jessica would treat Rita, no matter what she sort of did, Rita couldn't discipline Jessica and Vince was extremely frustrated by this. Rita, Jessica's mother, was extremely devoted to her kids. She dedicated all her time and effort into Jessica's well-being. Rita was selfless and tireless in her endeavors to make sure that Jessica was treated with care and encouragement. Raising a special needs child, I think, comes with so many challenges. And unless you've done it, I don't think we can understand the difficulties that come with that. And then also the complexities that come with trying to receive care from the healthcare system. Rita had apparently pursued multiple therapeutic options for Jessica. And I believe at one point she was so desperate to help her daughter that she paid $2,500 to a medium. Now this medium's job was to get the demon out of Jessica. This medium said that she initially quoted Rita $5,000 to get rid of the demon, but Rita had paid her $2,500, but she never actually received any treatment for Jessica. I'm not sure why this is because the medium said that she felt that Rita was desperate to try anything, anything to help her daughter. And Rita did try her best to help Jessica to prevent her outburst, to keep her calm, avoid her from hurting other people or herself. After finishing high school, Jessica was placed in supportive environments, but due to her many outbursts, she was asked to leave. Jessica was just unable to cope in these environments, so she was put on disability support pension. Now, Jessica wouldn't lose control all the time. It was only when things would provoke or upset her. From 2013 onwards, how old was she? About 20. She mainly stayed at home to keep her in a safe environment, to protect her from any dangers, keep her from endangering others. I said before that Jessica would normally get into fights with females at school, but This behavior had extended past this. She was not even interested in talking to other women because if they insulted her or became angry by her or distressed by anything she did, she would become distressed and it would kick in her IED. She preferred to talk to men because it excited her. Jessica had favorite numbers and colors and she would associate the two together in a condition she had known as neurasthenia. So for example, number two was yellow, five was purple, and three was green. So I believe the numbers, they translated to colors in her mind. 
So if you mentioned number three, she would not see the number three in her mind. She would see the color green. She would make up numbers, but these would translate to a color code in her mind, which would make her feel good. So she would actually make up phone numbers based on this color code, and then she would just call them randomly to see who would pick up. She would obviously prefer to speak to men, but one of the numbers that she made up and dialed was a Bangladeshi family, and they she didn't know this family, and she would call them up to a hundred times a day just because she liked the number, the color code. In 2018, Jessica began calling the staff of a Victorian meat company. She ended up developing a crush on the boss, Matthew Layfield. After she had called several of the male staffers, she then moved on to Matthew's wife and sister-in-law. And she had apparently told these women, I'll cut your head off with a chainsaw and flush it down the toilet. And I guess after being harassed, For a while, Matthew called Rita, Jessica's mother, and told her that things were just getting out of hand. Jessica had also been aggressive to women in the street or at shopping centers, and this led her to become banned from quite a few places, including her doctor's clinic. And this was because one time in the waiting room, she became aggressive towards another female patient, and she had to be restrained. And after that, they didn't allow her to come back. In 2018, in one of her attempts to help her daughter, she took her to Nepean Hospital in Sydney for treatment. And over here, Jessica became aggressive with the female nurse and she was admitted to the Nepean Piala unit for psychiatric treatment for nine days for an episode of severe mood disorder. She was placed on medication like lithium for apparent bipolar disorder and antipsychotic medications. But by late 2018, later that year, she was off her medications, which was also prescribed to help her suppress her IED condition. By July 2019, Jessica had a reasonable amount of therapy. She had seen multiple psychiatrists, but the improvement was very little and all her conditions put together only magnified the situation. And it's believed she needed constant treatment and her progress was just going to be very, very slow. On 20th July, 2019, the tension and pressure was building up between Jessica and her mother, Rita. That day, Jessica had become quite upset with her mother because her mother had been giving attention to another family member. She also felt that her mother had humiliated her in front of this man, but in reality, this man was just walking by them in a car park. He most likely didn't even pay attention to Jessica and her mother, Rita. Later that day, they went to Jessica's sister's place, and most of that day was just spent with Jessica arguing with her mother and her mother trying to appease her. A neighbor who witnessed the situation stated that Her mother was just calming Jessica down while Jessica was shouting and swearing at her and waving her arms about yelling and accusing her mother of always embarrassing her. Later that night, Jessica asked her mom to call her a doctor because she began having stomach pains. A doctor came, made her diagnosis, and Jessica's mother, Rita, wanted Jessica to go to the hospital for treatment. And after this, the doctor apparently went and came back, I believe. And when she came back, Jessica chased this doctor down her driveway where the doctor was able to escape in her car because she claimed she was so afraid for her life. Later, Jessica called the fast food chain Red Rooster three times at 9.18, 9.20, and 9.21 p.m. And she kept asking them for more food. I believe perhaps she must have eaten a meal from them earlier until they told her, like, just stop calling. Now, the whole day, Rita was trying to calm Jessica down, but it wasn't working. Jessica was just escalating. According to Jessica, her mother said, I've had enough. I'm ringing triple zero to get an ambulance here and put you back into care, back into the mental health care system. And that is where the attack began. In her police interview, Jessica claims that after this, her mother grabs her by the hair, drags her into the kitchen, pulls out a knife and tried to stab her. And Jessica claims this happens as she swears on her life. She claims her mother was just done with her and that she slapped her on her arms and her legs with an open hand. 
But later on, Jessica admits that it was actually her who grabbed her mother by the hair, dragged her into the kitchen, pulled out a knife and threatened to stab her with it. She said she saw red and ripped her mother's hair out. She then grabs this knife from the kitchen drawer as she wanted to scare her mother with it, but her mother was able to grab the knife and throw it away. Jessica then became so agitated that she grabs the knife again and begins stabbing her mother over and over and over again with it. At 11 p.m., an emergency call was made. On this call, Jessica speaks to the dispatcher and then passes the phone to a confused neighbor who kind of answers some questions, but then Jessica gets back on the phone and then seems a little bit more coherent and then explains to the dispatcher as follows. Mom has had enough of me because I admit I've been a challenge and it's this ongoing thing that has been going on for months. Anyway, she has had enough of me. She grabbed me by the hair and dragged me from my room all the way to the kitchen. She got a knife and tried to stab me with it and I grabbed the knife and thought she was going to stab me, so I stabbed her back. And I was so heated up with anger, I just kept stabbing and stabbing and stabbing her and I took off her head. She goes on to explain how she carried the severed head of her mother to a neighbor who wasn't much help. And she says, I had my mom's head in my hands. I know this sounds insane, but I was taking it for evidence to show the neighbor. In the struggle, in the frustration, I didn't know what I was doing. I cut her head off. I cut her head off with a knife. When asked by the operator, like, what knife did you use? She responds, all all sorts of knives. She says, there were about seven knives I was stabbing her with. A few of the knives broke. When that knife broke, I got another one. They're all in the kitchen. There's blood everywhere. So I believe after the attack, Jessica takes her mother's head to a neighbor's house, shows it to him, asks him to call triple zero, the emergency line. And then she goes to the footpath and she puts her mother's head down outside one of their houses. And this was because her hands were so full of mobile phones that she couldn't carry everything at once. And then she goes to another neighbor's house and then asks him to call triple zero. And this guy stays with her while she's on the phone with them. When police arrive at about 11.40 PM, they find Jessica standing outside her house in this blue dress with flowers on it. And she's soaked in her mother's blood. She tells an officer, I killed my mom. Mom's head is on the concrete over there. Can they sew the head back on? And then she repeatedly asks the officers the next few questions. She says, can you bring someone back to life if they don't have a head? There's nothing you can do. She's a goner. Because I know doctors sometimes can do miracles. They can't re-sew her head on. The officer then responds to her and says, "Uh, that's a bit of a stretch. And she says, I thought doctors can do miracle surgeries and put the head back on. No? Now, as one can imagine, the next few hours for anyone witnessing these events or even the police officers were quite bizarre. Jennifer is taken back to the police station. She's still in that dress that's soaked with blood. She's got brown paper bags on her hands to preserve evidence. And she's telling police officers what happened and she's gesturing with her hands. She says to the officers, I don't know how my sister and my dad is going to be towards me after this. She then tells police officers that she needed medical attention as her fingers could not move and she needed to get cleaned up. Following Jessica's arrest, her family, friends, neighbors, and psychiatrists who examined her revealed what life was possibly like for Rita and Jessica before this tragic and probably preventable situation took place if Jessica had received the proper care. It could have almost ended well before Jessica carried out a brutal murder motivated by jealousy, fear, and sadly enough, what they claimed to just be plain old hunger. That night, 57-year-old Rita was determined to make a change and begin living life for herself rather than giving her all to her daughter Jessica and catering for her every need. Perhaps finally placing her in a full-time care facility where Jessica would receive the treatment she so desperately needed. And before I forget, Jessica mentions in the emergency call that there is a four-year-old in the home presently. 
And when I looked into that, sadly, that night was the night that Rita was babysitting her four-year-old grandson. And during the attack, this little boy, oh my God, he fled into another room and he hid. A neighbor said she could hear the boy crying when she went inside the home. When the boy was found by the police, he was significantly distressed and he had minor bruising on his head. And I'm not sure what that was from, but when he was taken in by police, he was uh, taken in to see a child psychologist who had him express his feelings through drawing and talking. And my gosh, a four-year-old, I can't imagine him being in that situation. Imagine what was going through his head. Imagine how scared he was. The trial, which commenced on 20th November 2020, heard how Jessica was suffering from multiple illnesses before she stabbed her mother more than a hundred times in the neck, head, decapitated her, and cut out her eyeballs, her tongue, and her nose. Her illnesses were listed as autism spectrum disorder, intellectual disability, narcissism, and intermittent explosive disorder. I believe her sister had also said that Jessica also suffered from ADD and dyslexia. The crime scene showed a lot. It found a bloody scene and a number of items in the home, including eight DVD copies of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, five copies of the movie Jeepers Creepers, and there was no sign of a cleanup like Jessica attempted to hide anything when the police arrived. Apart from extensive blood stains everywhere and her mother's mutilated body, they found a box of latex gloves in Jessica's bedroom and pieces of what appeared to be the same type of blue gloves on Rita's body. And they found a crocodile Dundee figurine with its head detached from its body. And this was found in Jessica's room and they found blood soaked hair, human tissue, pools of vomit and blood soaked footprints all over the scene of the crime. Now, the pools of vomit, there was this other little piece of information that stated that there was a relative in the home who had apparently tried to stop the attack and um, he jumped on Jessica and tried to hit her with a cardboard box and he suffered a knife wound to his cheek and head and his hands and then he vomited at some point when Jessica was attacking her mother and then that's all I really could find about that piece of information. Jessica told the police that she got the idea to decapitate her mother, who was her sole carer, from the movies she was so obsessed with watching like Jeepers Creepers and the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and she decapitated her mother to end her mother's pain. Multiple people who testified at the trial stated that they believed that Rita was going to begin living life for herself. Rita wasn't just looking after Jessica, she was also looking after her sick mother who was bedridden. Professor Greenberg, who examined Jessica, said that even though she had low self-esteem and multiple personality problems, she exhibited behaviors of narcissism. He stated, she presents an egocentric or self-centered behavior. She has a history of demanding attention and a problem when attention is not focused on her. She has a sense of entitlement and an unreasonable expectation of favorable treatment. When her needs are not met, she can be furious. He went on to say that Jessica believed she was unique because of her disability and her sense of self-importance was exploitive. He said she feels her disability makes her special and she fails to recognize that other people also have feelings and needs. That Jessica was very sensitive to criticism and would react with disdain or rage. Jessica had told Professor Greenberg that at first she just wanted to scare her mom, but then she saw red and she lost it. She said she began stabbing her. She was having sick thoughts and she couldn't stop it. This is actually what Jessica said. She said, I couldn't stop stabbing her. I was getting her everywhere. I was getting the adrenaline going. Jessica denied having any psychotic symptoms, no hallucinations, visual, or she didn't hear anything and she didn't have any paranoia. The forensic pathologist who conducted the autopsy on Rita's body said that she had over a hundred stab wounds on her head and they couldn't even count the number of overlapping stab wounds that would have had to take place to perform 
the decapitation. Frida had died from multiple stab wounds with decapitation at the C2 vertebrae at the top of her neck. Six knives were used in the attack and were found surrounding Rita. And apart from the horrific stabbing and decapitation, a human tongue, human nose, and human eyeballs were found at the scene. And Rita suffered defensive wounds and injuries to her earlobes, which suggested that her earrings were pulled at and removed with force. There's a lot of damage in this attack. It's a very, very gruesome autopsy report. And it's hard to imagine that a daughter did this to a mother. The court heard about the forensic findings in detail, and they heard about the various mental disorders that Jessica had, how she would make those calls based on the color code and, you know, harass that Bangladeshi family, the Victorian meat owners uh, family. They heard about how during these phone calls, once the recipients of these calls got annoyed at Jessica for making these calls, she would apologize, say she was unwell, but then suddenly she would flip and things would take a turn and she would threaten them always, always, always with a stabbing or with cutting their heads off. Like that was how these phone calls ended no matter who was on the phone. The court heard that her mother Rita was at her wit's end with Jessica. The court then also heard from Jessica's older sister who delivered a really tearful victim impact statement. And she said that her mother was butchered like she was nothing and that she will never forgive her sister Jessica because her entire family had been trying to help Jessica from a young age and Jessica was aware of the amount of help she was receiving. Jessica pleaded not guilty by way of mental illness for the murder of her mother Rita. Justice Wilson stated, Jessica fully understood the nature of her act when stabbing her mother and clearly knew it was wrong. She fully understood the nature and gravity of her actions. In December of 2020, Jessica was found guilty of manslaughter, but not murder. She was initially sentenced to 21 years and seven months behind bars. The judge went on to say that Rita must have been in extreme pain and both shocked and terrified by what was being done to her by her own child. Later on, Jessica's sentence was reduced to 16 years and six months. And this is because the judge felt that Jessica only had a simple understanding of moral wrongfulness. And this was due to her developmental disability and autism spectrum disorder. And she had lost control of herself during the homicide. Jessica will be eligible for parole in 2031. Now that's not all because Jessica had her fair share of issues while in prison. Jessica was actually sent to the worst women's prison in Australia, apparently called Silverwater Women's Prison. And then she was also sent to the toughest wing, Willett East. This wing is actually a mental health unit. But in this unit, she had multiple altercations. One was when she threw hot tea on an inmate because that inmate wouldn't give her more food. She had attacked numerous inmates. And then another inmate, she attacked because she was asking this inmate for more food, but Jessica was holding three plates of food at the time. And the inmate said to her, haven't you got enough? Jessica flew into a rage and she grabs this inmate by the hair at such a force that this inmate had a big, bold patch on her head. Another incident was actually against a guard, and this was because Jessica managed to slip out of her cell, and the guard told her to get back in, and for a split second when she looked away, Jessica grabbed her by the hair and pulled so hard, she had to be restrained by three more guards. This guard was also left with a big patch of hair missing from her scalp and was so traumatized by the incident. When Jessica was questioned as to why she did this, she said, I don't like her. I just wanted to give her a little bit of the taste of her own medicine for the shit they've been doing to me since I've been here. Now I can go on and on. Jessica had multiple altercations with inmates and with other security guards and her MO seemed to be like ripping people's hair out. And she did this whenever she flew into a fit of rage. I find this case so extremely sad. It is just left this poor family 
with trauma for the rest of their lives. Jessica needed help and now she's not only lost her mother, but her carer, her protector, and her only real friend. Jessica is in prison and she says it's a living hell. And I know she's in a mental health unit, but I don't know if that's the same as a proper mental health facility. And I believe she's in there because of the higher security and, you know, a normal mental health facility might not be equipped to deal with her rage outbursts. And she's also in there with other women, women being the trigger of her IED. But then if she was with men, she falls easily for the men. So it's a tough situation, but with proper treatment, can she be rehabilitated? Professionals believe that there is a good chance. And apparently mental health care in Australia is quite shitty. And I can kind of see that because people with mental health issues or people who need help mentally are looked at with eye rolls, you know, rather than care. Prayers and thoughts with Jessica's family. I mean, you know, it's a horrific thing to go through. And I hope they can remember Rita for all the good she did and the wonderful person she was. Let me know your thoughts down below, guys, and I will see you in next week's video. Besitos. Bye.